Welcome to the Ohio Arts Council's Wright Gallery Programming Series for our current exhibition, Arts Beacon of Light, curated by Katie Monahan. Today, we are thrilled to present artist Charlotte A. Lees. As a brief reminder, everyone tuning in today is in listen-only mode. Feel free to use that chat function to ask any questions you might have, and we'll get to those at the end of the segment. Also, please keep in mind that because we're presenting from separate locations, there may be some variation of bandwidth. So if one of us freezes up or the sound fluctuates, thanks in advance for bearing with us. All right, thanks all. And welcome, Charlotte. I'm happy to be here. And I'd like to thank the Ohio Arts Council and Kat Sheridan and Katie Monahan for putting together this innovative exhibition, Beacon of Light. Next. My journey started quite young. I attended, uh, during Saturday morning classes, I attended Cooper School of Art, the Cleveland Art Museum, and the Cleveland Institute of Art. Um, so I had a good background of art education uh, before graduating from high school and going on to Bowling Green State University. I majored in art education as a safety net because I realized that very few independent creative artists make a living and I wanted to make sure that I could support myself. Um, after graduating from Bowling Green, I decided that I still needed uh, some more immersive art um, skills. And so I went to Case Western Reserve and the Cleveland Institute of Art. And uh, after graduating from there, I started my career as a teacher and I taught for eight years at Bedford High School and I really enjoyed it. But then it was time to raise a family. And um, as a result, the um, artistic and creative juices were put on hold. After a few years of motherhood, I decided to try to uh, go back into the art world and refine some techniques. So what do I choose but sculpture? I have never had any sculpture classes. Oh, I did have one. So uh, I hardly can count that as extensive training. So I didn't um, know why I chose wood, but there was an um, instructor at a local uh, art um, gallery. And so I signed up for that and he says, all right, first class, here's a piece of wood and you are to carve your name in it. Well, I wasn't too interested in carving my name in it. So he said, well, go ahead, get a piece of wood and here are some tools and get started. Next. This is my happy place. It's a view from my window and it will, influence my future work. But at the beginning of my career, I was more interested in wood carving. But hold this image in mind because it becomes very important later on. Next. This is my <clears throat> mindscape. And um, I just clip out various images that attract me, that say something that might be helpful in say a future composition. And uh, you know I can come in here and I doodle and uh, it's like I say, my clean space because my other space is a dirty space. And you can see on the right-hand side, um, the tin cutout. I am very interested in folk art. I think it has soul to it. And um, I want my pieces to have that same feeling of authenticity. Next, please. This is my basic workshop. Um, as you can see, it's very primitive. Um, however, 90% of carving or my work is done with hand tools. Um, I use a chainsaw and a um, reciprocal saw um, to do like the rough work to get rid of like the masses of wood. And then from then on, it's hand work. And you can see from my mallet that it is pretty well beat up because that's what you use. Um, I want to say that 
um, this workspace used to be in the basement. And, you know, I felt I was moving up in the world when I could finally uh, repurpose a bedroom, knock out the ceiling so I didn't break light bulbs and have an outside entrance with the hope that clients would soon be coming through my door. Uh, what a pipe dream. But anyhow, I love this space. It's small, but it works for me. Next. This is one of my first carvings. Um, it's made out of tiger maple and you can see the stripes in it. And, you know, I, I loved Henry Moore. And I think this just has the slightest uh, influence of his work. It's kind of a solid, massive piece. Uh, most woodworkers do not paint their work, but I was trained as a painter, as a printmaker, everything but sculpture, as I said. And so I have started to paint my pieces. Um, I, a couple of people say, oh, you're not gonna paint that beautiful wood. And I would say, I think I have to. So I think painting has added another dimension to my work. Next. Uh, my early training was in figure drawing. And I think most artists, this happens because if you can draw the figure, you can just about draw anything. I mean, it's the most complex um, imagery that you, you can figure, very challenging. And so um, I concentrated on figure drawing, like all the way through high school, college, you still got it. You know, it was, figure drawing was, was the answer. And then I started, as you see on the left, on the right hand side, I started stacking them up and, and developing some kind of relationship between the shapes. Next. Uh, here we see I've, I've advanced quite a bit and um, I like to group them together, have an interaction between the figures, um, much as in daily life you see people walking together, women, you know, holding hands or in a close contact uh, in conversation. So a lot of my pieces have this interaction and connectivity of uh, the female form. Also, very important to me is the base. Uh, a lot of sculptors think of just the image or, you know, the, the end product, but I think that incorporating a base, which is of course visually very important to the finished piece, uh, in, into the composition is, is essential. So uh, I think this piece worked out well. Actually, I, I had a um, fabricator. Um, I designed the base and then they fabricated because my steelworking skills are limited. Um, I also had the opportunity on the right to work in um, bronze, but uh, and as you can see, again, it's the figurative imagery and kind of the flowing um, aerobatics, just happy figures. You know, I'd like to make beautiful things. You know, that's my goal is just to make things that people enjoy looking at. And I unfortunately don't have a foundry in my little home studio. So I have been very limited in uh, producing bronze pieces, but on occasion I can work at a foundry and if necessary, um, do some bronze work. But wood is my forte. Next. Um, these are some examples of uh, large wood carvings. And the wood determines what the image is going to be. I don't try to force an image on a piece of wood. I, I kind of look at the, <clears throat> the wood and the two of us have a little conversation going and uh, we decide what's, what's gonna happen to this piece. Um, I like doing totemic imagery. Um, having been at the art museum many, many years, you just see a, a lot of the African uh, totems and um, th that was a big influence on, on my selection of work. So, uh, these totems, I have to say, when you first start carving, you have this block of wood. And as I said before, it determines what you're going to cut. So I visualize in my head and project it onto the piece because 
as soon as you start carving, you know, all the markings go away. So you really have to have it in your head what you want. And I can say this, and I'm not embarrassed to say it, that the first cut is always wrong. So after I choose an area that will be least harmful, and I start, and it's sort of like painting on a blank canvas, that first stroke is fearsome. And then once you get started, you know, it, it starts to flow together. And I think, you know, when I work that way, I roll the piece around and I work from all sides, making sure I have enough room for the nose at the end. But talking about faces, um, I have to be in the right frame of mind to do the face. Uh, I may have almost completed the, all, the, all the other appendages. And then one day I look at it and say, I'm ready. I'm ready to do the face. And so I do not do it until I really feel confident. Um, on the right-hand side, I, I did a lot of empowerment women. And uh, I, I never consider myself a feminist. I'm a female and I carve women. But, it, you know, it wasn't, that wasn't my goal. I just uh, liked the fact that Women are empowered uh, more and more uh, all the time, and they have spirit masks, and sometimes they use alternative powers in order, um, you know, to make things go more smoothly. So this was quite a complicated piece. Um, it was made from a piece of, um, let me see, apple uh, wood that was felled on our property. Next. You will see that I work in series. And I work in series because my attention span is short. And after I've worked, you know, five or six years on, in this case for the, uh, the figurative imagery, I start to feel the need uh, to be inspired and, you know, change directions. And in this case, I was very interested in historical and cultural patterns. And, um, so I incorporated in these container series and I call them containers because I hollow out, you know, large sections of, of the circles. And to me, they, they hold all those things that are precious to us, our memories. Um, actually, it's also very female form and, you know, it could be carrying food, it, it could be holding gold or whatever, um, but, they became very interested and to combine them with the cultural patterns I thought was very effective for me. I, I really enjoyed this series. These are fairly large, six, seven feet. So, you know, they are pretty impressive when they're grouped together. Um, I, I looked, I worked on this series for quite a while, but eventually I need to move on. Next. <clears throat> this is part of a pattern series. And my family, uh, the women, there are three of us, my mother and uh, she had three daughters and we all sewed. So I really think that in those early years when I was cutting out patterns and visualizing the three-dimensional quality you know, of, of what the piece of the dress, the, uh, uh, the sconces, the swags, whatever I was making, um, how they fit together, you had to visualize them. So I think that helped me a lot in visualizing uh, my sculptural imagery. I also like um, the, the cutout area. You have to be kind of brave to cut your piece up. And so, um, you know, it, at first it was a little shocking to me, but then, you know, I got the feeling of it and I liked the way it flowed and I liked the way it let in the background to come in to incorporate in the piece. And this piece is a spin-off, as you can see, from some cultural imagery, but also from quilting. Uh, these are quilt patterns, and you see a little stitching done inside there. So um, my inspirations come from kind of real life and um, try to incorporate them. Next. I was very fascinated in college and travels, looking at Greek and Roman architecture. I really enjoy um, the strength and the severity of the columns. And so, you know, that, you know, builds up in your mind over years and finally comes out as your own piece. 
you know, I try to reconfigure what I have seen and to make it my own. So on the uh, left-hand side is my column. And again, I did many columns, but um, this was, you know, cardboard uh, cylinder and um, I reinforced it. And there's a lot of um, hidden work in this piece, uh, you know, a lot of things for structural uh, uh, stability. And then I cut out, um, out of uh, metal and did some embossing of, again, cultural patterns, very traditional cultural patterns. And um, I, I was just fascinated with that. It was just great fun. And again, it, it expanded my artistic repertory. Next, please. Uh, this was great. We, my friend and I, Joan, who helped me do the PowerPoint, by the way, Joan, thank you very much. Um, we went to Oaxaca during a Day of the Dead. And I highly recommend that for an artistic trip. Um, it was so enlightening. Um, they have surrounding Oaxaca, they have traditional villages that just do crafts. And the whole family and, uh, you know, the extended family, they all learn from three or four years old to working on pottery, making little balls, and then selling them to us tourists. And um, weaving and decorating those wonderful uh, animals that they do. And I bought many of them and brought them home. And we had some time and we decided to take a workshop. And the one thing that I did was I did metal embossing. And it had, it was revolutionized uh, some of the, the things that I was doing as far as applying additional material to my work, added material. And so uh, here we are uh, playing around with metalworking. Next. From my kitchen window, I have a bird feeder and all I see are the backs of the birds. So I decided to do my own bird backs and embellish them with uh, the metalwork. And again, I just find the metalwork, you can do so much to them, you patina it. Um, you know, I would put it in my oven to dry it so that, you know, I, I could work with it. Um, and you could form it around various things. And um, it was a little tricky sometimes to adhere it to another surface, but I figured that out eventually. So uh, these are my bird bags. Next. During COVID, I wasn't able to travel. And so I made my own virtual travel pieces. Again, totally different. Again, another series. Um, you're going to think that I just flit around from one thing to another. But my attention span, I work for so long on one area, and then I kind of dry up and need to be inspired. And so I, I, for some reason, just do something completely different off the wall. So this uh, are wood planks that I have done uh, transfers on, stenciling, mixed medium. And over top, I float a piece of plexiglass. And then on top of the plexiglass, I draw a map of my virtual travel over this particular area. And I found it challenging. Uh, first of all, just how to put the stuff together to make it work. And, um, you know, just combining the different levels uh, of the mapping and, and the imagery and uh, kind of how I wanted to to pursue it. And it, it again was a challenge. And many of these challenges require a lot of early morning, late night thinking. And so sometimes my sleep patterns are a little difficult, but I often find that in the early morning, I call it during my hibernating period, I can come up with some of the best solutions for my my uh, problem areas. So I go into my studio early morning. This is the benefit of having your studio at home. I could go early morning with my cup of coffee and look at my piece and try that variation that I had been dreaming about and see if it works. Sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. Next. <clears throat> Getting the wood. It's not like going to Home Depot or Hobby Lobby and buying wood all nice and clean. Um, my dear companion and friend, <clears throat> Ron, has a wooden lot and he had trees cut down 
and logged and stacked in his backyard. Um, he has a wonderful um, wood workshop. The tools I had not access to in my primitive technique. So it was a learning curve for me, but he stood by my side so I wouldn't uh, hurt myself too much and um, taught me how to use all the tools in his workshop. And so on the left, I'm selecting a board and these boards are huge and heavy and they're eight to 12 feet long. So you, you maneuver that into the shop and then you cut it into manageable sizes. And then <clears throat> um, one of the processes I use is cutting out the negative shapes. I like to use um, this imagery because it's very generic, it's playful, and most of all, it incorporates the space in which it's living. It, you know, you look through it and you can see, uh, you know, the wall behind it or the wallpaper or, you know, it just in, incorporates the space. And that part I like a lot as compared uh, to a painting that has a hard edge. You know, so this, these pieces kind of flow. Next. More of the process. Um, again, I had to learn to use planers, joiners, uh, heavy duty saws, uh, uh, chop saws, and I loved it. Um, it was just another whole world for me. And then um, after you do all the prep work, you have to glue it together into shapes that you think are going to be usable, making sure that the glue joints are tight and um, that everything is level and square. Next. This is the final piece. Uh, it's eight feet long and assembled in sections. Um, it's for a women's shelter, and it was the only piece of original artwork in their facility. And when I was installing it, the children that were walking past down the hallway were absolutely uh, taken with it. They were asking all kinds of questions about it. They wanted to know what the figures were doing, and um, you know, they made up their own little stories. It, it was just so rewarding. Um, underneath this, which isn't shown here, is um, I put the donor names in, um, um, well, mounted on a stone looking um, background. So that it looked like uh, the foundation for the buildings. So uh, er everything kind of worked together. Next. Sometimes you just have to look at the wood and let it talk to you because uh, to try to superimpose your idea on the wood doesn't work. I have found that out many times, and it's a for, uh, just a useless experiment. So on the on the left hand side, I just fell in love with the shape of this of this wood, and uh, I really did not know what I wanted to do with it. And I kind of fold around and fold around, and then it started to formulate that I was going to do a, a spin off of the my COVID travels. And so, you know, I had the copper, this is a mixed medium. I had the copper um, and the uh, aluminum embossing on it. And, um, you know, I had some stenciling that, you know, I'm pulling in all the tricks that I had done previously and try to incorporate them, but it developed on its own. It just came its own way. Um, and, um, you know, the black circles on the bottom just remind me of maybe uh, outer space, you know, giving it like an earth um, view at, at night or something like that. I don't know, it just seemed to settle the piece. I did not have the yellow line in it originally. And I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, something is not singing to me, it's just not working. And so if you can imagine that without the yellow line, it's like boring, you know, so, so Again, you have to be kind of brave to, to go ahead and alter your what you thought was your final image. So I added the yellow line and I sat back and I said, yep, now the piece is happy. On the right-hand side is um, a plank piece. Um, this is cherry wood that I had in, we logged from our property and had in the rafters drying for many years. And it's a, a reference to my property. Um, there's birch uh, bark on the top and bottom from birch tree that fell down. And of course you can see the water waves um, going across our lake. 
and over the lake are flying bats that are collecting their bugs for the night. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have as many bats as we used to, but uh, this is an ode to bats. It's called Night Flight. Next. Uh, here we go on something else. Uh, I love to walk in the woods and I love fall. Doesn't everybody? I mean, you pick up these colorful leaves and I uh, walk through the stacks of leaves, kicking them up and watching them fall down. And so on the left is my interpretation of falling leaves and you know, using different textures, patterns, um, photographs that I took of, of the leaf um, canopy and then transposing them onto the piece. Next, something completely different. Um, this was part of my pattern series, but it was one that I struggled with uh, for a long time. I, I think many artists suffer this. You know, you're, you're working on a piece and you want to like it, and you know you've spent so much time on it, and the concept is good, but it just doesn't doesn't sing to you. So I worked on it for as long as I could, and I I thought I was done. I put it away. Well, a couple of years later, I pull it out and say it's time for me to attack this again and recut it. So. I recut it and um, I really like the linear outside edge. I mean, it's to me very exciting and it, it into the background. It, it becomes integral part of, of your space. And um, again, it takes a lot of courage to cut up a piece that you spent days or months on working and then um, decide to do something different with it. But in this case, I personally feel that it was uh, worth the effort. Next. <clears throat> this is part of my nature series. I've moved on to another series and uh, it reflects again, uh, my love of the woods. And I would take photographs of, you know, the trees and night scenes and so forth. And then I transpose them onto wood. And when I walk in the wood, you look up in the trees and you, you, know, you see the leaves and everything, and then you hear the birds, but you don't always see the whole bird. So this is my uh, interpretation of walking in the woods and hearing the birds and then just seeing bits and pieces of them. I, I guess it's, I take nature, I reimagine it and deconstruct it and put it back together again. That's sort of how, you know, and again, my goal is to make uh, interesting, beautiful pieces. Next. Part of the nature series, um, I started instead of the leaf shape, I started doing circles. Circles are such an iconic shape. Uh, they hold a lot of mystical meanings to them. And to me, these were like the earth, moon and sun shapes. And so, you know, I did the, the night and day imagery. Um, I have my cutout areas that you can look through them. And the hardest thing of this was putting it together. Um, you know, structure is important. I mean, it has to, it has to look good uh, image rise, but then it has to hold together as well. You know, it's craftsmanship. This is the craftsmanship of it. And so uh, and this had a lot of different pieces. This had, you know, like the two half uh, moons on either end and then the linear part together. Uh, again, those were all separate pieces. And to make sure that it didn't um, sag or fall apart, you know, it really um, took a little bit of thinking to put it together. Next. Oh, and this is, you know, this is an artist's nightmare, you might say, because. On the left is what I call long leaf sculpture. And I went to India and the women were sitting along the roadside during a festival making um, jewelry, necklace, earrings, neck, uh, bracelets out of this plant that was called the long leaf. And um, then it was disposable at the end, you know, and they would throw it away at the end. So if you go to India, you can't help but being impressed with all the henna designs that they do. So I came home and I thought, well, I'm going to do this long leaf because I wanted to do a sculptural image. 
And I covered the entire thing with henna shapes. Well, it took forever. And I kept trying to like it because, you know, I spent hours and hours on it. And it was just too confusing. It, nothing, you know, everything was blending together. It was just awful. And so I had to put it away because I had spent too many hours on it. So I, I just put it away for uh, actually a couple of years. Um, I think it was maybe during COVID, I pulled it back out and I said, I have to do something. So I painted the whole thing white and that freed me up completely getting rid of all that hard work that I'd done before. And I, I turned it into this, which I think is far more successful. Uh, less dramatic on the um, right-hand side was a piece that I merely cut up and reassembled and added just a few little um, dolls for a, a, an additional interest, but it's part of my um, uh, nature series. And um, it just, to me, it almost re reminds me of Japanese kimono somehow. But um, anyhow, I like it much better. And after all, that's what it's all about. Next. I, another influence, rocks and water in nature. So, you know, these ideas, you, you look at something and then you store it in your memory bank for sometimes years. And then it comes out. You, it comes out as you and not as a copy of reality. So here I've incorporated um, my experience with metal uh, work. And you know, I was fascinated with the strata of the rocks. I went to uh, Las Vegas and probably one of the few people that immediately rented a car and went to the mountains and never went on the strip. So when I was in the mountains, that's where I saw these rocks. And, you know, it took, I was just taken with the patterning and it took many years before I could figure out how I was going to incorporate it. This one is entitled Playmates, but I think a better name is Gene Pool. So uh, next. Here are two other of my Playmate series and uh, my Las Vegas, Las Vegas rocks, you might say. And they're big. They're like 50 inches by 40 inches. And uh, I incorporated, again, the metal work. Uh, one is more like a waterfall. One is more like a, a, a brook, a, a splashing brook. And um, again, these were some of my, like my personal favorites because of how difficult it was to incorporate what my vision was into what the end product was. Next. Ah, this is from uh, the exhibit Beacon of Lights. Um, these are organ pipes. Very interesting for me because I have not noted to work with found objects. And it happened that a friend of mine had gotten some, maybe three organ pipes and brought them over to my house and said, Charlotte, you know, I think you maybe you might like these. And I thanked her very much. And I quickly put them in the basement because I was not at all interested in them. And they sat there for years and I'd walk by them. I'd walk by them. And then, ah, a new series develops. So I bring them up and I start working. I had three of them and, you know, I put them in a show and someone kept saying, oh, you're the pipe organ lady. And so they would start dropping off pipe organs at my house. And I ended up with 40 pipe organs. And so, um, you know, what, what do you do with them? And so I'm thinking um, music, musical notation, uh, sounds and sounds of nature, leaves rattling, uh, you know, musical instruments. And so I started um, kind of freewheeling as far as, you know, my inspirations go. And I have to say out of 40 of them, I don't repeat myself. There just seems to be an endless number of variations that you can do. Um, I thought I was done, but someone dropped off five more big pipe organs. <laughs> and so I have those waiting and um, I'm not sure when I'll get to them because I'm in the middle of another series right now. Next. But it's, it's kind of good to have friends that think of you, you know, drop off things. 
Um, this is another series I worked on called Wetlands, again, related to my walks in nature. Um, and I like to, like I say, um, use previously seen images and I store them and then they come out in a different way. Uh, kind of, um, they're altered and reimagined. So you can really see the, the influence here. I love walking on boardwalks and bridges when I go to the parks. And so in this series, almost everything has some sort of um, abstract boardwalk in it. Next. And here you can see uh, what influences me and what happens in, in the translation of it. Um, again, boardwalks and reeds and water and swamp and design and patterns and reflections, all of those play a very important part in this particular series. Next. Um, this is what happens when you have a lot of leftovers. You know, they, you, have, you, you thought you're going to use in a piece and uh, it didn't work and, and you just put it aside. And then finally you have all these little bits and pieces and you're in between series. So, you know, you're just kind of waiting for this inspiration to hit you. And I start to assemble things. And by golly, I come up with something I actually like. So these pieces, both of them are a result of of a combination of my past series um, put together and you know, created what I consider artwork. Next. This is another part of me. Um, I have like two styles, you might say. I have one I call my studio art, which you've been looking at. And then I have my public art. And public art came about very accidentally. I had no experience in public art. I had no quote team that would support me in it. Uh, I work alone in my studio every day. I, you know, I, I don't have any assistance. So um, for some reason I applied to do a, a sculpture and actually won the competition and then I actually had to make it. So that's where the problem came. You know, I didn't know anybody um, and I thought, well, I can do it. You have to be, artists have to be very myopic. We can do it. You know, there's, there's a way. And so I started calling around various, uh, I chose very small fabricators because I thought they would talk to me because I didn't know their language. They didn't know my language, but between the two of us, we would come up with, with a suitable um, structure that would work. So this one is about 18 feet tall and wide. And it's, uh, as you can see, it's a circular area and the words are cut out at the top. And when the sun comes, they reflect down on the ground. And as you walk around it, you kind of incorporate it into this uh, make-believe world of words and, and um, shapes. Underneath there's a seating area for this. Next. These are two smaller projects I did. Uh, the one on the left is working with the city. And that's another whole uh, uh, issue, you might say. But they're always very happy. Uh, the community is very happy. And we had a meeting at the community and decided, you know, they approved of the piece and everything. So when I give the, the final maquette to the city, they say, oh, we're worried about um, all the cutout areas that they're going to climb them and use them as a, you know, as a gym set. And so instead of those areas that you see outlined cut out inside, I had to fill in and make solid so that the children wouldn't climb it. But, you know, in this case, my artistic um, vision was slightly altered. And of course I would have preferred it cut out, but, you know, when you work with the public and it's public art, you have to make some concessions. Um, the, other, the other one is a sale. I call it sales. It was a private commission uh, for a family that had uh, several children and boats, and it was uh, installed in Sandusky overlooking the river. And uh, I still like that one a lot. It's very playful. It, ha it has those, you know, stylized figures, and it it's a happy piece. Next. 
this was a major undertaking. Um, by this time, I had a few people, uh, what I call my team, <laughs> of, of me and two other people. But you don't have to tell anybody that you don't have, you know, uh, you know, 50 men behind you working. So anyhow, uh, I actually got this commission. It was for Rockville, Maryland's uh, downtown center. So it was quite a distance from Solon, Ohio. And um, it's made out of stainless steel. It's 18 feet tall. Um, those granite bases each weigh 100, uh, you know, 1,500 pounds. And so, you know, we're moving some heavy stuff and fabricating. I The place where I chose to work, uh, you know, they, they make... Um, various engine parts and they make um, cylinders and col they don't do columns, but I said, you know, can you make me this, can you, you know, break these um, metal sh uh, sheets into curves? And they said, well, we can try. So, you know, a lot of experimenting and, you know, I was able, they were able to do something. And by the way, these men who never do artwork are so thrilled to work on a piece like, they are so proud of it. I take pictures at when it's installed and send it back to them and they hang it up on the wall. You know, they are so happy to work with them. I have, I have just found that, you know, when you just ask for help from various people saying, you know, you're at your, their mercy and they step up and they, they help you through things. So artists, I want to tell you, try everything. Do not limit yourself. You can get help. You can figure it out. It's like important that you do that. Next. Here's some of, again, how do they do that? The process, this is water jet cutting and it is the, my choice of, of fabricating. It makes nice clean cuts, doesn't burn the edges. It doesn't ruin the material. And, um, you know, it's amazing. It's just water under pressure cutting through, you know, plate steel or aluminum or stainless. Um, it's, it's quite fascinating. I, I was amazed at, at what it could do. Next. This is part of the transportation from Cleveland to um, Rockville, Maryland. Uh, you know, you plan and you plan and you plan because you want to make sure you have all the equipment that you need because once you get um, to your destination, you know, you don't have time to go shopping. So, uh, we planned and planned. And of course, uh, one of the trucks broke down on the freeway. And, you know, so then you have to make adjustments. But the gentleman in the back is my go-to man, Dale. Um, he, you know, he can manage everything. He, he was an iron worker and uh, he, he just carried the ball for me. He's my team. Next. Uh, here they are drilling uh, the supports for the, 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 into the concrete and into the, uh, the, uh, stainless steel. And I love the picture on the right. Uh, OSHA would not approve of this. But in this case, the guys would do anything. I mean, artwork is never square or easy to get, you know, put together because it's unique. And here this guy is doing his best to put together this rather unique sculpture. Uh, he didn't fall, by the way. And everyone was rather happy. And I also learned how to order uh, lifts and tow motors and all, all the equipment that we needed to move our stuff around. And again, these people were very helpful. They knew I didn't know what I was talking about. Next. Uh, sometimes I take summer vacation and um, just doing something different completely. And this was for the botanical gardens. Um, they wanted, they gave us a bike and told us to create something. And I made a butterfly bike. And I went to a local bike store and got some old uh, gears and, and um, chains and uh, created my butterfly bike. Next. I also dabbled in a few other things. Um, I loved the metal work. And you know, maybe in another life, I would do large scale metal pieces. But right now, I have to be satisfied with some small little gadgets that I make in the summertime. I also did a little bit of woodworking and uh, woodworking doesn't allow you the flexibility that sculpture does. 
Um, you know, once you kind of cut out the shapes, it has to go that way. And it's far too limiting for me um, to, to do it full time. And in fact, I've only made two tables and a couple uh, mirror frames, but um, anyhow, it was a good, it was a good exercise for me in self-discipline. Next. Uh, I also did some clay work. It's very nice to have an additive method of building rather than just a subtractive. I just feel like it's so much more freedom uh, and you don't have to worry about running out of clay or running, you know, so um, I enjoy that. And I really like the imagery. Again, I, I like the the sensuality of the fish wrapping around. And I, I did do several fish in, in women, um, some in clay and some in wood, and you'll see some in stone. Next. Um, this was a summer project that turned into be a couple year project because I fell in love with stone. A friend of mine uh, who I visited quite often uh, was working in stone and, and it was beautiful and I would admire it. And so she gave me a piece one time and I said, well, I don't, I don't know. I've never carved it, but I took it home and by golly, I looked at the piece and I saw a lady in there and I just carved it out and it was, it was quite acceptable and the stone was beautiful. So that started my whole um, adventure in wood. I mean, in stone and I would go to New York City with some of my girlfriends and they would all go to Bonwit Teller and even Marcus shopping for clothes. And I would go to Soho in the basement of an art store and roll around rocks from all over the world and find ones that I thought were suitable and then have them shipped home to my house. And uh, then that's how I would work. And, you know, I would, I would go to dinner kind of dirty and scrudgy and they were all dialed up in their latest finery. But anyhow, I worked on these stone pieces and stone is like dirty, hard work. Um, but the end result is, you know, the, the stone is just sings to you. It's so beautiful. It, you know, this just happens to be a, a, a rather uh, oh, solid um, Virginia black stone. But the other stones are, uh, you know, from Portugal, alabasters and uh, Carrara marbles. And those are gorgeous. You, you can't go wrong with them. So anyhow, I, I developed a little bit of an outdoor studio so that I could work outside. Uh, wasn't quite as disastrous, but you know, you're covered from head to toe uh, in you know uh, fine uh, sanding uh, stone dust. I, I did many of these beautiful figures. I mean, they just were falling out of the stone. I just couldn't do anything but beautiful ladies, and I thought this is getting boring. So. <laughs> so Unfortunately, my husband would say anything uh, that was really successful, you got to quit doing and move on to something else. So that's exactly what I did. I had to leave this and go on to another series. Next. Um, this, this is where I'm at now, more or less. Uh, it's Bentwood. And this happens to be two cutoff ends of wood that's called bendy wood. And it's flexible to a certain extent. So um, I I didn't have forms for these, but I, I just uh, drilled holes and I used uh, threaded metal and I pulled it together to, to make my um, column shape. And again, I guess this is a throwback to my Greek and Roman inspiration. So, you know, everything is connected uh, aesthetically. So, and then um, I like, I got into stencils and, you know, I just, you know, and this is quite abstract for me as compared to all the other pieces that I've done. Next. Ah, process. Um, I, my friend and I decided since we go, couldn't go to Europe that we would go to a workshop in the United States. And so we decided to go to Penland, which is a well-known craft school in North Carolina, very near Asheville. And so I thought that before I went to this class, I saw the, the write-up and it, it was called Working in a Vacuum, but the picture was of a curvilinear thin shape that looked very sculptural. And I thought, I better learn a little bit about this process because, you know, I know nothing. 
And everybody that's going there is going to like have a leg up on me. So I go on to YouTube and I see that um, what they're doing is they're bending long, narrow strips, you know, in um, equipment that is fabricated to do that, you know, under pressure and, and, you know, and could carry the steam and had temperature gauges and all that stuff on it. And, um, but of course, just like woodworking, it's not what I wanted to do. I want to do some thing wide and bigger. So, um, and I did, but I didn't really want to invest in all, all that equipment. First of all, I'd have to have it special made because they didn't have anything that I wanted that you could make. So uh, I, I did my own. And this is where I tell artists that, you know, you can do, don't be limited. Don't limit yourself. Just, just experiment because what difference does it make? So I got my little uh, hot plates and this is my turkey roaster. And um, I figured out that I can put my, um, cookie sheets over top of it and create my own little steam table. And so I, um, I read more about it and says, you know, cut very thin pieces of wood and you soak them for a day uh, with a little downy in the water so that it uh, softens the fibers. And then after um, you soak them, you transfer it to a steam table and you steam it for about a half hour. Then very carefully with Hot proof gloves. You take it out of the out of this bath of water, and you quickly you have about a minute and a half. Take it over and bend it around forms. Next slide. These are the forms, and again, handmade forms. You know, nothing nothing perfect by far. This happened to be PVC pipe, and um, um, a form that I made to do half circles, and again a lot of experimenting, a lot of breakage, a lot of mashing of teeth, but eventually, you know, you figure out what you need to do. And uh, you can see on the right that I have a series of, of columns that I made out of, out of very thin bent wood. And you can see also the different types of wood that I have. You know, there's, uh, you know, um, ash and uh, cherry and walnut and, you know, maple. So anyhow, you have different ones. However, I realized um, at the beginning, well, it took me a little while to figure it out that my forms weren't always uh, perfect because it wasn't under a controlled uh, cooling period uh, set up. And so sometimes they were bigger at the bottom and smaller at the top, or they weren't flat or something. But, you know, you learn to work with that. And, you know, once I discovered that was the problem, I, I could remedy it by very primitive techniques. Next. These are some of the images that I ended up with, some of the experiments. Uh, also, you can see I like patterns and I'd like to incorporate them in my pieces. Uh, I also saw it was a challenge of putting them together because they're hollow and they're somewhat fragile. And so that was another whole construction issue that I had to solve. And there's nobody to tell you what's right or wrong. There's no one to say, you know, this is how it's done. Uh, you just figure it out. You know, it takes time, just figure it out. Next. Um, I started, you know, sometimes the piece of wood, in this case, the back piece of, of cherry was just too beautiful to cover up or cut up. You know, I just, you know, love the grain. I love the texture of it. And so then I added the bent wood on top of it. And I also started covering them with handmade papers. I would go to um, Morgan Conservatory in Cleveland and uh, you know, buy papers from, from artists that, that made them. And uh, I, I like the combination of the natural materials together, adding more texture and interest to the piece. Next. Here are, here are some more of my pieces. And Again, they take a life of their own. I start thinking about it doing one thing and it's not working and it's not working. And then I think of something else. And then by accident, I might, oh, um, accidentally put a piece of wood down someplace on it. And I think, oh, I think that works. And, you know, so I have to listen to the piece. And um, the piece on the left really was a composition of accidents, you might say, 
you know, they were odd pieces that I found and I put them together and it, it worked. And on the right, um, I really liked um, the vibrancy of, of the lines and, you know, maybe the juxtaposition of the simple background with, with a rather exotic uh, placement of the columns. Next. Uh, this was at Penland working with, uh, working in a vacuum. Out of the 10 students, there were only two of us that weren't making furniture, chairs, and tables. And so the instructor says, uh, we're not we're not doing bent wood. We're doing working in a vacuum, which is laminating, uh, you know, a thin veneer over top of a, you know, a, a piece of wood that's going to be a tabletop. And I said, well, gee, that's not what I'm doing. <laughs> and so he said, well, I'll help you as much as I can, but I really don't know anything about what you're doing. So it was it was still a wonderful, wonderful experience. Penlin on any of these little art um, um, schools. It's a heaven for artists. I mean, everyone there is so happy to be there. They're so willing to share what they're doing. It's so inspiring that even if you quote aren't successful, you still are successful because you've gotten so much out of it. it it's it's just wonderful. It was very invigorating, and I actually did get something out of this whole process. Um, I experimented, and I actually did come up with something of value. Uh, in the back is a actually a real form that I made that is legitimate. And um, it, it makes uh, my Bentwood far more, um, oh, uh, easier to work with as far as constructing. Okay, next. This is the table and it drops down uh, with the, the um, clear plastic. And then there's a machine that sucks out all the air creating immense pressure. It will crush most anything. And so uh, it makes a really tight seal. And when you're laminating, you want to make sure that uh, the glue and the, and the thin veneer are evenly uh, pressed against the shape. So I was, I, I thought it was just really cool the way that that whole thing worked. And so uh, you put it in here. Uh, it's two pieces of wood that there's glue in between. Uh, it's this bendy wood. And uh, you vacuum it, it stays in there for a couple hours, and then you take it off and you've got a great, perfect shape. Next. <clears throat> These were some of my shapes that I experimented with. And uh, again, some were, were broken and I had to reimagine them. And that's great because um, it took me out of my comfort zone and that just gets the juices flowing. And uh, it just helps your creativity to just move out of being stuck in, in a place. So there are some pieces there of bent wood that I did at home that I brought. And then the leaf shapes are all the, the, the shapes that I created from my experiments. Next. These were two of my finished leaflets. And again, they're very different than anything else I had done, but still you know, working with wood in a new format. And it was just so freeing uh, to, to work, you know, constant stress, you know, like you wake up in the middle of the night and you're thinking, what am I going to do with this piece? And, and you mull over it and, you know, and by helter skelter, you end up, it frees you. It ends up, you can make whatever you want out of it. So uh, this one I added uh, fabric to and material and uh, paper. And, you know, to me, they they really work and they were a challenge just because they were so different. And um, you know, now I'm eager to see what direction my next series is going to be. I'm, I'm still like at the tail end of my um, container series, but I feel I'm the urge I'm going to start to change and do something different of which I'm not sure yet. But um, I'd like to thank everyone for coming and your, your time is valuable. And I, I hope you've enjoyed the presentation. Have a great day. Charlotte, thank you so much for the, for the generosity of your time. Um, I, 
think that you've shared a lot that's going to be very helpful for many people. Um, we are out of time. So uh, again, thank you, Charlotte, for sharing with us your process. Um, thank you to Katie Monahan for curating this exhibition, uh, to the Ohio Arts Council's board, to the governor, the legislature, who all support the Ohio Arts Council, this great space, and of course, Ohio artists. Uh, thanks, everyone, and have a great rest of your day.